I want to start off with a confession, uh, something that I've actually not told many people. There's a few, most of the members of staff have heard this and some of my family members, uh, but it was so embarrassing to me, I never told hardly anybody else, okay? This happened eight years ago. Uh, I was, had been on staff here for two years, and I had preached several times, but this was the very first Sunday that my former boss, Jamie, uh, trusted me to preach and kind of run the Sunday morning while he was out of town. He was going to be traveling, and so he, he put me in charge for the morning. You're going to preach and just make sure things are okay. It was Kyle Thompson's first uh, Sunday that he was going to be doing something up front, and so I was supposed to be with him and kind of help introduce him and, and orient him and help him uh, be prepared, and I had all, another thing. Uh, this, is, this, this is part of my excuse uh, here, is that my wife was out of town, and I was sick, okay? Uh, so I took some NyQuil on Saturday night and uh, set the alarm, and in the morning, I, I woke up, and oh my gosh, I woke up without my alarm. How fortunate, I thought to myself, and I was a little, still a little groggy from the NyQuil, but I was, I was waking up, and I kind of rubbed my eyes, and I look over at the clock. Now, something you should know if you don't know this already is we have an 8 o'clock service, not just 9.30. This, the earliest service is the 8 o'clock service. I look at my clock, and it says 8.25. Oh. <laughs> 8.25, and I'm still foggy, and I rub my eyes again, and I look at it, and I'm like, there's something significant about 8.25. <laughs> right? I'm thinking in this fog. I'm like, 8.25. I remember eight, what's, I remember someone 8.25, and I remembered 8.25 is the time I'm supposed to be standing up here to preach. <laughs> there's 25 minutes of, like, announcements and worship and, like, the, the plan. I remember looking at the paper, and it says, 8.25, Matt stands up to preach. And I was like, but I'm in bed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you think you have a fear of, uh, of getting up to do public speaking. I have a fear of not getting up uh, to, you know, in the morning to do public speaking. So I, uh, there was like an AM, PM switch thing, you know, that old thing that happened uh, on my alarm. And I was like, oh, that's it. I just said, oh. And I... <laughs> I just, I just, oh, I just threw on my clothes and I grabbed my Bible and I, and I, and I, and I, I approached the church rapidly. Um, and I was in my chair eight minutes after waking up, okay? And it turned out, thank God, the announcements went long. And uh, other things happened in the service and it just, everything had gone, uh, had gone long. So 10 minutes after I woke up, the thing ended and I stood up to preach with two pillow lines on my face, okay? And I never told anybody. <laughs> Actually, I, did, I never even told Jamie until after he resigned. I was like, hey, by the way, uh, one time, <laughs> you know, I slept in, you know? But it was just this terrifying experience of like 825, 825. <gasps> and it just hits me all of a sudden, and I just imagine all these, all these things come to my mind of, of what could have been, and it terrifies me. And ever since then, I set three different alarm clocks in different parts of, of, of my house, right? And I have this, this morbid fear that I, you know, of that, right? So something can happen where you just see something and it just brings something else to mind and you have this full body reaction. It can also happen in a positive way. You know, this often happens with the sense of smell. You, you smell something and it evokes something positive. Uh, whenever I smell like pine trees or uh, baking cinnamon, those two smells, they do something in me. They, they remind me of Christmas morning at my parents' house. And I remember the... Um, the coffee cake with that kind of cinnamon crumble topping, baking in the oven and the Christmas tree and, and those things. And, and, and then inside I feel like a sense of peace and love and excitement. And then I'm like, oh wait, it's not Christmas. It's just someone's got cinnamon rolls in the oven, right? But you, you know what I'm saying? There's something that can come to you and it reminds you of something else and it draws with it feelings and a whole experience. That's something that I want to show you that happens at the beginning of the Gospels. We, we've been going through the story uh, all these many months, and I, and I thank you so much for doing that and reading the Bible, investing that time to read the story, this condensed, abridged, um, chronological version of the Bible. And we spent a lot of time in the Old Testament. And now just last week, we arrived in the New Testament. Last week was the birth of Jesus. Today is the early ministry of Jesus. And today we're going to see, beginning with John the Baptist appearing and everything about John the Baptist and then the baptism of Jesus and the early ministry, it is just loaded with what I'm calling these biblical deja vu moments. 
there's this moment in which there's just this subtle thing. It's like a phrase. It's just a word that's spoken. And it calls to mind this rich experience, this rich memory. If you're someone who's steeped in that Old Testament, as the, as the Jews would have been that Jesus first uh, appeared to and, and, and ministered with, um, they were steeped in this Old Testament story. And so these, these subtle references can call to mind things that, that are symbolic and have meaning and, and, and they enrich our understanding of who Jesus is. So you have actually, many of you have spent time in the Old Testament in recent months, and so I want to walk you through some of these things and see if they call things to your mind, see if it enriches your understanding of Jesus and who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do. So the first one, if we look in Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to walk you through a few. I'll give you a couple, and then I'm actually going to, I have some giveaways, okay? So, all right, now you're awake. Uh, for, to, there's a couple of questions I'm going to ask, and if you are the one who raised your hand and answers it, uh, these are um, the story devotionals. It's like 365. It's a real nice, like, devotional guide that's, like, based on the story. So, you're awake now? Okay, so the very first one um, I'm going to throw out, actually, uh, this is John the Baptist clothes. Now, this one you're not going to get from the story because, uh, much to my chagrin, this particular detail was edited out of the Old Testament version. So, okay. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. There's not a lot of people in, in the Bible that they describe the, the clothes, particularly these unusual clothes. This is not common clothing. But this happens to be the clothing that Elijah wore, the prophet Elijah. And it, there's a times in which he's actually recognized. They're like, well, who was it? What did the person look like? And they say, oh, well, he had this hair shirt and this leather belt. Oh, that's Elijah. And John the Baptist is specifically mentioned. And why is that? Well, Elijah was this great prophet from the Old Testament that called out the people of their rebellion, called out the idolatry of the land. And in particular, there was this, this power, this 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 this, this um. Uh, contest of powers between uh, Elijah calling on the power of God versus the, all the prophets of the Baal and these 300 prophets dancing around. And it was a contest of who's really in control of the world. That's going to be a major theme today. It's something that we, we hear in, in, in Faustine's uh, story of, of, of Rwanda and all the suffering that, that, that the nation of Rwanda experienced. Like there's so many things where you could say, boy, it seems like God's not in control. It seems like there's these other powers that are in control and yet gave witness that today the church is, is backed out down the streets, you know, trying to get in to, to praise that God. That's a, it's an experience of the power of God winning out over rival powers. And that's called to mind at this very moment in which John the Baptist appears just simply by his clothes. He's like, oh, that's the one who told us the power of God is greater. And there's all these things about John the Baptist like that that call things to mind. This next one I want to show you is about his food. It specifically tells us what food he was eating. And he ate locusts dipped in honey. Anybody ever tried that? A little weird, right? Not one of the forbidden foods in the Old Testament, but also not one of the favorites, okay? Not something there. Locusts and honey. And I got a prize here for if anyone can name me both a time you remember locusts in the Old Testament and a time you remember honey. Anybody? Yeah. Real, real loud so people hear you. Uh, two different parts. Hey, give him a hand, huh? Well done. Enjoy. Of course, I'm giving this to someone who already knows the Bible, so, you know. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah, so the, the, the locusts, right? The locusts were one of the plagues that God uh, unleashed, you know, through Moses' proclamation on uh, Pharaoh in the land of Egypt when the people were enslaved. When they were, when they were entrapped, enslaved, and the Pharaoh would not let them go, the powers of the earth were, were, were suppressing them and would not let them go, and God sent this, this plague of judgment, one of them being the locust that came and just devoured crops and devoured all sorts of things, and it represents that, that power of God, the power of judgment of God. There's also a couple other references of locusts in the Bible. Actually, that same power comes on the Israelites uh, when, they, when they rebel, and God sends that as a way to get their attention. It's that destructive force, and it's something that 
that God says he's going to actually re redeem the people. Even foreign armies are sometimes compared with, with an army of locusts coming in when they're, when they're so plentiful. But, the, but the, probably the, the plague is, is the primary one there. And then honey, you mentioned honey. The promise was they would not always be in the land of slavery. That God would rescue them out of that oppression that they would make it into the promised land and the way the promised land was described is the land flowing with milk and honey, with good things. The honey corresponds with the blessing of God. You will be there and I will provide for you and, and there will be, you will come upon wild sweet honey which will nourish you and give you energy and will be sweet to the taste. So John the Baptist's food corresponds to this, this uh, destructive force, of the, the kind of destructive judgment power of God and also the power of, of blessing. He's holding these things together while wearing the clothes of Elijah who demonstrated the power of God over the power of the idols. All right, the next thing is, and this also has a prize, uh, is the location where he was. We can call up the, the next slide with the map. It said that he was preaching out in the wilderness of Judea. I put a little arrow in a box there to show you uh, where this is. This is the wilderness just to the east of the Jordan River. I've been there. It is just a desolate place. It's just like almost no water. It's really hard to imagine people surviving out in that, that wilderness. And then if you show them the next slide also, I'll make this a package deal, and they were being baptized in the Jordan River. So, so he's, he's out there in the wilderness and then actually doing baptisms in the Jordan River. Uh, this next prize, and our last prize for the morning, is if you can tell me the wilderness, where do you remember the wilderness in the Old Testament, and what do you remember about the Jordan River? Anybody? I was like, I should have read the story. Oh, man, they, they, they can all sit together. Oh, wait, you have to answer first before I give you the prize. Nick. They, well, they were in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Then, don't they cross the Jordan River? Oh, my gosh, this row is so good. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to call that our seminary, our seminary section. So, yeah, so the wilderness. So when the people left the land of slavery, and they, they went, and they had to go through that wilderness. They actually went, you know, up and around and through that wilderness, and it's a, a lot of, some good things happen. That's where they received the law. It's also where they started practicing idolatry. Uh, it's where they were coming to the promised land, and then they got scared because of, of, of the lands. They thought maybe the powers in the promised land, the giants of the land, they thought, were too powerful, and they shrank back because they couldn't trust that the power of God was stronger than the powers in the land. So then they wandered in the desert. They wandered around until such a time came as they were courageous enough to take that leap of faith and cross the Jordan River into the promised land. That's when the whole battle of Jericho happened, Right? So there was a moment in which they ended up sort of choosing to stay in the wilderness because they were too afraid of the powers in the land, but God brought them to a time in which they could then come and cross out of the wilderness into the promised land across the Jordan River. It's a very symbolic place in their history. It's, it represents the transition from slavery into freedom and into the land of blessing. And in that location, he's dressed like Elijah, and eating locusts and honey. This is all rich, rich symbolism. And it's communicating something to the people that we all need to know is, is that there are ways in which we are all enslaved. We are all still captives in Egypt or like exiles in Babylon. These, these, these hard experiences that they have had in their history, and they're having an experience right now, the, the people, the, the Jewish people, as they're oppressed by Rome, they're suffering all these sicknesses and, and diseases and, and demonic oppression, and they have these kind of the Pharisees ruling over them, putting these spiritual, you know, kind of religious laws on them. This is a hard time in their lives. And it's into that context that we have the power of God evoked, to rescue a people from slavery, lead them through the wilderness, over the river, through the waters, into a land of blessing, flowing with milk and honey. And in the context of all this rich symbolism, John the Baptist has one recorded sermon, one thing that he preached over and over again. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. That is his message. And when Jesus takes, uh, after Jesus is baptized, and he goes out and Jesus starts, uh, starts, starts preaching the gospel, this is the gospel that he preaches also. Jesus also preaches, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is so important to understand what God is saying. First of all, repent means just simply turn around. You, you have been going the wrong way, 
and you need to turn around, also you're able to turn around because the kingdom of heaven is near. What do you remember about the kingdom in the Old Testament? We studied this in the story. What do you, what do you remember about the kingdom? Anybody? See, I got no prizes left, so I have no volunteers. <laughs> the kingdom... Okay, well, the, the, the first king that we had in Israel did not happen right when they got to the promised land. There was actually uh, hundreds of years before that where they lived in the land before they demanded a king. And when they demanded a king, God didn't want to give them a king. And they insisted. And he said, okay, fine, you can have King Saul as a king. And then from that point on, they had a human king who always disappointed them, every king. And kings led them into sin, and king took their wealth, and took their horses, and took their women, and all these things that they did to them, uh, and eventually led them into idolatry, and they lost the land because the kings failed them. The powers they lifted up for themselves to fight the powers they were afraid of failed them. When they were given a king, God is trying to cheer up the prophet Samuel, and he says to Samuel, you know, don't, don't worry, don't feel bad. It's not you they have rejected. It's me they have rejected as king. I mean, the whole beginning, the whole kingship, the whole monarchy of Israel represented a rejection of God as king, the original vision of life in the promised land. God said, I will fight your battles and keep you safe. I will protect you from these foreign gods that you fear. I will protect you from these armies. I will protect you from famine. I will nourish you. And I will give you justice. I will be your king. And from those early days, they said, well, that sounds good, but, you know, can we have a real king too? And always these kings failed them. And always these kings led, us, led them into sin and disappointed them. And here we have good news. to these people who've even lost their human king, and they were taken away in exile, as you remember. And then now they're kind of conquered by Romans. And things are hard. And they have no power. There's all this power over the top of them. And they feel powerless. And then there's this good news. Repent for the kingdom of God has come. It's near. It's right here at hand. It's, it's approaching more every day. And it's accessible to you. And so you can turn around. So the, the response they give to this is in verse 6. It says, confessing their sins... They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. They recognized that their sin is part of their captivity. It's not just these outside powers. It's also their choices that they have made. They've enslaved themselves to darkness. They're part of the problem. And it begins with them acknowledging that. And that, 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 that the act of repentance, the act of, of being baptized, is, is, is part of his is, is act of confession, saying, me too, I'm a sinner. And part of my problem is I'm enslaved by sin. And Lord, I entrust, I, I, I entrust myself to you. Some of the symbolism is the water is, is washing away the sin. It comes and it, and it, and it cleans us just as, as, as Christ's blood, as, as Christ's power comes and, and cleans us. That's part of what the meaning is. Also, the, the going into the water is symbolic of crossing the Jordan River, crossing from the, the land of slavery, the land of wandering, uh, into the land of promise. It's coming into God's place. And it marks an entry point. It's an initiation into the kingdom of God instead of just the kingdom of the world. It's an acknowledgement that I will now be a citizen of heaven over my citizenship anywhere, anywhere else. This is all the rich meaning of baptism that's happening there. But can people trust that this is true? Because now they've heard these words. Jesus just simply says, you know, after, just like John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. They might hear those words and they just sound like words. Like, I don't see... A kingdom of heaven. I just look around and it just kind of looks like the same kingdom I was just in. And maybe you sometimes look around at your life and you look around at your kingdom and you think, well, I don't see the kingdom of heaven. It, you know, it just looks like there's a lot of other powers over me. And that's where I'm at. And so more and more gets revealed to them over the course of the story. Jesus, first we understand who Jesus is because Jesus is the foundation of all of it. And then we understand what his kingdom is and he gives us signs of the coming kingdom. So we hear a couple things about the character of Jesus so we can begin to trust, at least we can trust the character of Jesus before we begin to think of us, is he powerful? John the Baptist says something uh, specifically about uh, Jesus in... Uh, John chapter 1, verse 29. Again, another biblical deja vu moment. Uh, in 129, John the Baptist says, says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I bet that if you've read the story, you've been reading the Old Testament, the, the Lamb of God calls some things to mind. We want to take a stab? The Lamb of God, what, what do you remember the Lamb of God? Anybody? Sacrifice. sacrifice? Well, which sacrifice? Different? There's, okay, this is good. Okay, we have Passover. The Passover, when they're enslaved, the blood of the Lamb is put over the door and the Spirit of God passes over and the firstborn child is spared of everyone that the Lamb's blood is over. That's one. A sacrifice. Which sacrifice were you thinking of? What's that? The, okay, there's like, there's like the temple, there's the, there's the purification, there's the act of atonement in the temple, there's that sacrifice, which the blood of God pays for the forgiveness, or the blood of the lamb pays for the forgiveness of sins. And another one? Yeah, Abraham and Isaac, right? We talked about Abraham and Isaac, in which the father, the, the father of the people of Israel, the original, uh, you know, covenant, uh, he's asked to give up his only son. Would he love God so much that he would give up his only son on that altar? And then right before the angel stops his hand and says, no, the Lord will provide, and there's, there's a ram at that point, uh, is, is provided and becomes a sacrifice. And now we know that there's this expectation that that will be actually fulfilled through a son at some point. All of this is called to mind. He says, look, there's the Lamb of God. And it tells us something about who Jesus is. Okay, the Lamb of God, the, the, of God. I mean, this is almighty God. And think about all the power we've seen demonstrated from God in the Old Testament. The creation of the universe, the, the moving of nations, the upending of, of civilizations. That's the power of God. And a lamb led to the slaughter. Could anything be so weak and so tender? And they're put together, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is how you can have the guts to confess your sins and, and, and to believe that there's hope for you and you can be freed of your past and your addictions and your bad habits and all your hang-ups, that, that there's some hope for you. You can, you can confess them to Jesus and he can do something about them because he's the power of God and also willing to be that lamb that takes your place. There's one more I'll show you about the character of Jesus. The voice from heaven at the baptism, right? Jesus is baptized, and there's this voice from heaven that says something very, very significant. We read that in um, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my Son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. The voice from heaven is singing two different sections of two different songs. They come from the Old Testament. I'll show you this next slide. The first part of it, this is my son. This is a quotation of Psalm 2. The coronation song. The coronation song, when a new king was put in power, they would sing this song of blessing over him. This is my son whom I am uphold. This is, this is the son of God. This is the king of kings. This is the one that God's power is behind. This is the messianic expectation of a powerful Messiah that would come and lead the, the, lead the armies and that would, that would come and, and, and establish the glory glory and power of, of, of the people. The Son of God, the King of Kings. Also quoted Psalm 42, the second part comes from that song. This is a, a song that goes from Isaiah 42 all the way through Isaiah 53, and it tells the story of someone who would come and be meek and mild, who would be led like a, like a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he goes forward. This is the one who, on him, the iniquities of us all would be laid. This is the one on whom his, by his wounds we will be healed. The suffering servant. And at Jesus' baptism, the voice quotes these two great songs from, from, the, uh, from the psalms of the kings and from the songs of the prophets, and he puts them together and says, that great king of kings will be the one to be the suffering servant and will bring freedom through his own suffering and service. This is the character of King Jesus. Now that tells you that he has both power to be obeyed and, and, and he's going to have authority over the things that terrify you and also that he's trusting and loves you and has your best interest and will serve you. The king who would become a servant Immediately after that, after all of this thing is tapped into, so now we have a sense of like, okay, so we are in a place of, we are in a place of, uh, of, 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 of slavery, of, of, of darkness, and it seems like God is not in control. We now have, okay, there's this 
person who has showed up and, 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 and evokes these themes of God's power and presence and, and, and of his deliverance in the past. And then we have this, this actual Jesus identified as the person who will bring in this power, who's the Lamb of God and who's the servant king. And it's announced that his kingdom has arrived, is coming more every day, and that we can switch sides and be part of that kingdom. The confusion of who's in control in the world uh, has really come to my mind in the, in the news this last week. There was one particular news story that I was just glued to. I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe my eyes watching it uh, unfold before me. I'm not talking about the Pokemon Go phenomenon, by the way. Okay? Uh, I'm talking about the, the, the coup attempt in Turkey. I don't know if you saw this on, on the news, but I, I've been amazed. As someone who's been there, has a heart for that, that place, I, uh, I was amazed. And, and I want to I show you this brief uh, video clip, and then, I'll, then I'll, I'll show you how I think it connects. Let's, let's watch that. Tanks on the streets. Jets overhead. The world watched in shock as a military coup unfolded in Turkey, a NATO country and ally of the West. The army attempted to put Turkey's main cities into lockdown, taking over state television and instructing a newsreader to announce a peace council was now in charge. <laughs> Turkey's increasingly authoritarian president appeared to have lost control, but not for long. Recep Tayyip Erdogan appeared via a mobile phone link from the coastal resort of Marmaris, looking less than presidential, but using an independent TV channel to call his supporters onto the streets in defiance of a curfew ordered by the military. I invite the public to go to the airports, go to the squares, go to the streets. Let's gather together. They can come with their tanks and cannons and try to show what they can do. There's nothing more powerful than the people. I haven't seen anything more powerful. We can show the tanks who is powerful. In the face of gunfire from government troops trying to hold them back, supporters of the president tried to cross the main bridges linking Istanbul, vital communication links which the army had tried to seal off. Did any of you watch this on the news? This was just a... Amazing to watch. The thing that really struck out to me is that all in a, in a, in a second, just all in a night, the, the, the forces of the coup, they tried to just seize all the symbols of power. So they attacked the parliament building and sent the, and sent the, the, the government ministers kind of into, into hiding, and then they showed pictures of, of that. They, they put tanks up on top of bridges that would be public, and so you'd see, oh, look, they're in control of transportation. They had planes and helicopters flying low, so you thought, oh, they have those forces. They took over all the media outlets, and they had all the familiar news anchors announce that there was a new government, there was a new power. So the, the idea was to convince everybody all in a minute that they were in charge. And, you know, I think that's... that's that's what the devil has done in our world, is, is try to send us a lot of signals that he's in charge. So we experience, uh, we experience uh, suffering, we, we, we experience there's, there's dying and there's death, there's corruption, there's, there's sin, there's brokenness, there's, there's everything around us that gives us symbols of like, my gosh, this world is just totally out of control. It must be the devil running things. In Turkey, the president was away on vacation, and when this happened, they, they, they timed it that way, and so he had to somehow get a message across to the people. Now, these people are imposters. They're not really in control. We're going to take our country back. And the best way he could do it was through FaceTime with a reporter. Can you believe that? And she's holding up the phone. Talk about the low-tech solution. She's holding up a phone with a little microphone and, like, the camera, and that's how he addressed the people and said, they're not in charge. We're going to... We're taking this back. And then systematically, they took back every kind of symbol of power. Police went in on the bridges and, ho I mean, amazing things. People stood in front of tanks. He eventually, he flew back and showed up in the city and, and, and showed himself the crowd. And they, and they do these demonstrations of power where systematically, one by one, all the symbols of power they take back. Well, there's a moment in which John the Baptist, the one that we've talked about that was the one who declared him to be the Lamb of God, the one who baptized him, the one who heard the voice from heaven, the one who had access to all these signs, the one who had stood in the desert with power. Well, he got thrown in prison, which would eventually lead to his death. He was arrested for opposing the king. And John the Baptist, it seems, had a moment 
of doubt. And he says this um, in chapter 11, um, verse 2. When John, who was now in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, so uh, are you the one to come? Should we expect someone else? As in like, you know, I didn't totally envision myself in jail and losing my head. Are you going to come bust me out? Or is someone else coming? What's the plan? Sometimes when things are really dark and there's still these other powers at work in the world, we can question like, is God able to save me? All these promises I've held on to from the Old Testament, all these hopes I've had all my life, is God able to deliver on them? And here is Jesus' response. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. All throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus doing demonstrable acts of power to show us the authority of the kingdom, this new kingdom of God, the, the, the kingdom of God who has returned, the kingdom of God that's establishing itself, the kingdom of God that's growing every day in our lives and our midst now, that will one day come in its fullness and establish justice and peace on the earth forever. That there are these in, signs of the inbreaking of the kingdom. You find it hard to believe that God is in control. Watch this. And he walks up to a leper and he touches him and he embraces him. And by his very touch, the man is made clean. He goes to that woman that we, we talked about last week who was bleeding and it was, it was disenfranchised because of that. And, he, and, he, and, he, and she touches his robe and, and she is made whole. He goes up to, to, to a man who, who's, who's on the ground and he, and he lifts him up. He, someone who's blind, he makes him see. There's this crowd of people that are hungry and he multiplies like a little boy's lunch and turns it into food for 5,000 people. He sees a person who's oppressed by not just one demon, but by a legion of demons. And with a word, he speaks it out. Demons see him. They've just oppressed people for years. They fall at his feet and they say, Son of God, have mercy on us. And he does all of these things to demonstrate to the people that the kingdom of God is here. And you can trust in the power of God even though you're going to be afraid of things in your life. And I know all of you have things in your life you're afraid of. You're afraid of death. You're afraid of poverty. You're afraid of maybe other spiritual forces. You're afraid of so many things. Can you trust that despite all that you see around you that seems like evidence of the contrary, can you trust that those are just, that's just a coup attempt? That's just kind of um, a show of false power and that really God is in control and God can set you truly free. This is our Savior, the Lamb of God, the Servant King. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your power. We thank you that we can trust you. We pray that you would, in fact, give us the courage to believe in you, to trust you, to confess our sins, to turn around, and to live courageously in your name as you establish your kingdom in all its fullness. In Jesus' name, amen.